Welcome to another edition of Divine Warrior Ninjutsu Podcast. This is podcast number nine for March 6th, 2018, and I am your host, Shihan Jason Steves. Today, we have a few things in store for you. I have an interesting guest with us today. As some of you may know, I have done some training with the CIA. I do not claim that I work with the CIA, because I did not, but I did train with them. I did some basic, uh, I suppose you could say they were recruiting part of their what they would do in recruiting or whatever. Anyway, Jason Hansen is an ex-CIA officer. He, I, I, I believe he was with them for seven years. And he's got an interesting story. He now teaches some of that uh, CIA training as a civilian, on, a, on the civilian counterpart. And I did my training with him. And um, I don't want to say too much because I want the interview to speak for itself. But uh, this is a very interesting character. It's not very often that you get to meet a retired CIA officer who is willing to impart his official government knowledge onto you so that you could be a better blank, whatever it is you need to put in here. Basically, if you ever watch the Born Identity, this is the real deal. This is the guy. And of course, if you study ninjutsu, there's a lot of these things that he teaches that they don't teach you in uh, Japan. Nonetheless, it is still ninjutsu-esque, so to speak. So, without further ado, here we go. How are you, Jason? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? So let's start with something simple. Tell me about yourself. Tell the tell our listeners a little bit about you to get us going. Sure. So born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area. And like many kids who are graduating from college, I needed a job. And so being in the D.C. area, every government agency in the world is there. So I sent out about, about a bunch of resumes and applied. And I actually, my first job was with a local police department because they were the only one who called me back in time uh, when I needed that job. But very shortly after I joined the police department, I got offers from the Secret Service and the CIA. And I figured the agency would be a heck of a lot more entertaining. So I joined in 2003. I left in 2010. And it was a wonderful place to work. They treat you very, very well. Um, but I did have that entrepreneurial bug. And I did not want to work 30 years and get a pension. I wanted to go do my own thing. So it was just a natural fit from going from what I was doing to leaving the agency and doing the spy secrets that I'm now teaching to people to keep them safer. So why did you leave the CIA or how did you get out? What's the process of leaving the CIA? Is it like the military where you have uh, blocks of time and you have to wait for your contract and all that stuff? How did you get out? Why did you get out? Sure. So that's kind of a funny story in itself. So I, you know, I'd worked there for almost seven years and I was ready to leave or actually six years at the time. And so I printed out my resignation letter, took it into my supervisor, and I said, listen, you know, I love this job. You're great. Things are great. But I just, I, you know, I, I want to go do different things in life. And he kind of looked at it and he said, no, 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 we're so short staffed right now. You can't leave. Come with me. <clears throat> and so I'm walking with him and he's taking me up to uh, uh, someone, uh, a head guy at the agency. I'll just leave it at that. And this head guy didn't know me from Adam, but he says, hey, this is Jason Hansen. Here's what he's done or here's what he does. We're very short staffed. And so this guy was like, listen, you can't leave now. He said, what about if you just work part time and give us, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week? And I had no idea you could work for the agency part time, <laughs> you know, going from a great or a nice income to nothing was scary. So I said, oh, sure, absolutely. So I worked part time for the agency for almost a year. And then they were trying to bring me back on board full time. And I said, no, 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 I really got to leave for good this time. So finally, in 2010 is when I left for good. Who was the director at that time? Porter Goss was the director uh, when I left. So when we think of the CIA and like the movies, the Jason Bourne identity and stuff like that, how how similar is that? Is there like you know the the alternate egos and the fake IDs and the the, the you know twenty passports in your luggage and all that kind of stuff? No, I did not have that. As much as I'd like to you know admit that sexiness always happens, um, but of course you know I did see good of stuff, and I'm going to be very vague just because. I, I just released a book called Spy Secrets That Can Save Your Life through Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And I had to send that book to the agency to review to get their approval to release it to make sure there was no classified info. And so some stuff which you don't think is classified and you're like, that's no big deal. They exit out, they black it out and make it redacted and you realize it's classified. 
So yes, there was some stuff which I can't talk about, which is secret, and I'm just going to leave it at that because obviously I don't want to get in trouble with the agency. Seems like everybody's dream would be like working for a secret agency like the CIA. So I don't understand why when you said they were short staffed. It seems like everybody and their neighbor wants to join the CIA. So can you explain why they were short staffed? Well, the you know since obviously September 11th, the agency has been so busy, so slammed, has taken on new jobs, and and people are just spread thin, kind of thing. So at the time, just like many other offices, they were spread thin because they were added so many more duties. And you know, to get a person on board, it took me 12 months to get my top secret security clearance. And so it's just a very long pipeline to get somebody through that, to send them to the training to do all they need to do. So they hate to lose people because it may be, you know, two or three years before they can, you know, take someone from zero to where they need to be. So let me get this straight. When you were in the agency, about the times that you gave, the years, that's about when the born identity came out. His name was Jason. Your name is Jason. Is it about you? <laughs> you know, I, I, I wish I could say like I was at bars picking up women left and right, but that is the one downside is you're not going to a bar being like, hey, baby, I work for the CIA. You're pretty much going to the bar and making up some bland cover story like, oh, yeah, I do marketing or, you know, I'm an accountant that nobody really wants to ask more about. So it, it didn't get me much mileage out of that. And I was single at the time. So going back to the reference of the born identity movies again you see them fighting on the movies what kind of uh combat training do they do for the cia agents in real life anyway the agency people that we're well trained you know we do i was fortunate enough to do evasive driving the firearms hand to hand self-defense knife defense so i was very blessed to get a wide array of training so you use the word entrepreneur while you're at the cia can you tell us what you meant by that I probably really, you know, you hear those stories about some people are like, at seven years old, you know, I was doing the lemonade stand, but, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so obviously I needed a job. I wanted excitement in my life. I wanted to do something which I thought was important. Uh, so that's why I joined the agency. And then I still had the bug, but I, I wish I could say that, you know, the day I joined the agency, it clicked that I was going to go off and do this spy company, but it still took me a very long time to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do when I left. So what did you do first? How did you make that jump from working for someone else to being the entrepreneur? What was the first things you did and how did you make that transition? Well, at first I was doing mostly corporate gigs. So I would, you know, a CEO would hire me and I'd go train him. And then he'd say, whoa, you know, my wife needs this or my daughter needs this. So originally it was just, you know, CEOs, executives, celebrities, people like that. Uh, it slowly morphed into doing the you know everyday civilian quote unquote, and then of course after I was on Shark Tank, that's when it really introduced it to the masses, and that's where you know every background now is taking my training. So again, I wasn't some brilliant mastermind who had it planned from day one. Is it just morphed like many businesses do from these CEOs to their you know family members, wife, daughter, kids, and then to you know now everybody is doing it, and as. Um, I said when you know before we got on. Now we're franchising spy schools all over the country because fortunately we are so busy, and I can't be in a hundred places at once. So then, after your first appearance on television, you were just doing like one-on-one, -on -one, like a freelance guy. Well, I was doing that, but I still had my spy courses. So I was, you know, I put seventy-five to a hundred people in a room and do a spy course, and these are ones all over the country that I'm doing. So it's my two-day where you learn how to pick locks, escape duct tape, become a human lie detector, uh, detect surveillance. So I was doing that, but I wanted to learn how to kind of take it to another level, obviously, because as I said, you know, I can't be everywhere, and I really wanted to grow this business and train more people, hence why we're franchising spy schools now. So when you did appear on TV, was that your goal, was like to get onto television as your next marketing step, or is this something that just kind of happened to spur of the moment? How did that come about? I didn't always know. A, f a friend of mine was like, listen, you should apply for Shark Tank and, you know, watch a show and loved it. And so one day, and I was, you know, again, fortunately, my business was already doing, you know, good. It wasn't like I was going homeless or anything. So one day in, in between my busy day, I got online, I filled out an application. And after that, I, I totally forgot about it because it was probably four months had gone by. And then I think I got an email that said, hey, we got your application. We want you to create a video for us, and we want you to fill out 10,001 pages of paperwork. And then I was like, oh, yeah, holy smokes, this, you know, this dream could actually come true. And then I filled out the paperwork, and then 
you know, I had to uh, have my background check, my credit check. So it's, it was a long process. It was, you know, almost like having to get your top secret security clearance. So from what I understand, one of the sharks that you partnered with, you were asking for $100,000 for 15% of your company, and he partnered with you, and you guys accepted the deal, and you went forward. What kind of things did he do to promote your business further or to help you grow? What is, what is exactly that kind of came out of that? Sure, and, and you're 100% right. They came down hard on me, and they were telling me, no, this is a dumb idea or this is horrible. And I admitted to them, and I, I believe this didn't get cut out. I said, listen, guys, I am not the business expert. I'm the expert in the training and the spy skills I teach. You know, if I was the business expert, I wouldn't have wasted my time coming on here. I would already have, you know, a $100 million a year business. So I 100% agree with them that they had the business knowledge that I didn't. And, you know, one thing that did get cut out is um, we have 320 acres at Spy Ranch now. As I told them, I didn't expect 80,000 people a year to come out there. This was for people who were serious about their safety. So the people, you know, the executives or whomever that really took it seriously. Uh, so my business really actually didn't change that much based on any of the advice they gave me because after Damon and I became partners, we kept doing this spy training all over the country. And then we did start the ranch where we have people come in there. So, you know, fortunately it was the publicity, it was Damon John's connections. He helped me get this book deal and other things that just elevated it to another level from the foundation I already had. So from what I understand is that they wanted to have something near uh, a rural area where people could just kind of walk in off the street, almost like a little shop or uh, a mall kiosk type thing. And then they would appeal to the masses, but you wanted something more secluded and remote where high uh, high rollers would basically come out and they would have to go there and they would be stuck there and then they could work with you almost in seclusion. Is that right? Yeah, I believe you're right. And then Mark Cuban, and again, I can't remember if this was in there, wanted me to do a kind of a tough mutter thing for a much lower price right. where you're getting people on this obstacle course or something. Uh, so that didn't interest me. But the, the spy schools, the two-day spy training, we do do all over the country. So we go to L.A., we go to you know Chicago, um, at, you know any major city. And so that is already in there. We do do that. It works great. And then the serious people – come out to Spy Ranch where they take the evasive driving, they take the you know combat tracking or the pistol or the rifle courses. So are you still teaching those courses yourself or have you handed this off to someone else underneath of you? No, I'm still teaching them. I mean, I'm still, I, I love the teaching part. So I still go out. I've actually tomorrow, uh, no, Thursday and Friday, uh, I have a evasive driving course that I'm teaching for the entire two days. So I do have guys that do a lot of the training for me, but I try and teach as much as I can because that's what excites me. So what's the next step in the evolution for the business? Are you going to be teaching the courses around the country yourself? Or are you going to pass that off to someone else and you're just going to kind of stick to your, your ranch and teach the good stuff? Yep, you're 100% right. So I'm going to stick with Spy Ranch doing the evasive driving and all the pistol and rifle and more advanced training. And then all the spy schools around the country are going to teach the how to escape duct tape, how to pick locks, how to detect surveillance. They're also going to teach home defense, like how to make your home like a CIA safe house and also self-defense with a tactical pen and other tools. So they're going to have about five different classes they can train, and then if people want the more advanced training, then they can come out to Spy Ranch. So it sounds strange to think that an ex-CIA officer is franchising CIA skills out to others. Now, is, that's a really weird concept. Can you tell us a little bit of what, what that looks like and what you're doing to make that happen? Sure, yeah. So as you said, you know, I, I quickly realized I can't be in 100 cities at once, and we are so busy getting requests that, you know, we decided obviously a franchise makes sense. So I'm very fortunate to have a franchise partner who's an expert in that. And he is kind of running that and taking care of all the documents and all the franchise law. But the way it works is they're obviously going to have to be heavily vetted from me. Uh, clearly, it's my reputation and not everybody is going to be able to make it as a franchisee. But they're going to come out to Utah at Spy Ranch. I'm going to train them for several days on everything. They're going to be able to go back to their location and be able to teach the multiple courses, the multiple spy courses we have. Um, right now, it is $50,000 for the franchise, but because we just signed a reality show deal with a company who's going to pitch a reality show and other things, uh, January 1st, it is going to $100,000. And then the courses, the model is it's going to be a bunch of four-hour courses for $299 each, 
And if people train just 10 people a week, so let's say every Saturday you had 10 students, after all expenses, you can net $120,000 a year. And then, of course, we're going to have all the national marketing. We're going to have the website to funnel all the customers for you. So kind of my job is I'm still going to be teaching at Spy Ranch, but I'm, I'm fortunate enough to go on TV shows all the time, which, of course, is going to you know, flood the uh, airwaves like it does and get a lot of students for whatever the local franchise is. How are you going to pick your franchisees? What kind of skills or prerequisites do you want them to have? You have to be able to teach the stuff I do. You're obviously going to have to be able to pick the locks and escape from duct tape. Plus, you've got to be a nice person who can teach in front of a class. Or if you're boring as can be, no one's going to want to sit and uh, listen to you for four hours. So they've got to have excellent customer service skills in addition to being able to do all the spy training that I do. So tell me about your business partner now. How's that going? And who is it that you're partnered with and what's he doing to help you out? Sure. So going in, actually, I wanted Damon or Robert. Those were my two choices. And I did more research on these guys than probably anybody's done in the history of Shark Tank. And I figured they would be my my best choices. Um, I went with Damon because I know he's a brand building guy. I know that he understands marketing very well on the uh, type of marketing that I like to do, which is direct marketing. Um, So I took the deal. I think for 45% of the business, which is what I accepted. And he was great. He was, uh, you know, you never know, obviously, what these guys are going to be like behind closed doors, but very down to earth, you know, incredibly friendly. Uh, Before, you know, we used to talk all the time. I had a cell phone number. I could call or email him. Of course, now that we've been together longer and I'm so busy, you know, we just talk when uh, stuff comes up. Uh, but, But the book that just got released by Penguin Random House last month, he helped me get the book deal. So he was instrumental in that. And, you know, another thing that I really like about him is he never says, like, this is the way you have to do it. He's like, listen, this is your business. Here's the suggestion. Here's how I would do it. And, of course, the majority of the time he's right because he's worth a gazillion dollars and I'm not. He's not overbearing and, you know, not anything like, you know, it's this way, you know, my way or the highway. So as I understand it, at first he didn't like the idea of you opening your ranch in Utah, but you had to convince him that it was a good idea and sell him on the idea. Is that how it went down or what, what really happened? Well, of course, I have to make it sexier, more exciting for TV. But I basically said, Damon, I know this is going to work. You know, and he was, you know, he was like, eh. He was like, all right, then go ahead and do it. So I did it. And then, of course, it worked. And we have people flying out here all the time for the courses. So, like I said, the good thing about him is, he, you know, he doesn't really push back. He says, all right, if you want to try it, go ahead. Here's what I would do. And then you go ahead and do it. How do you deal with copycat artists or people who basically want to imitate what you've done or maybe they've taken your course and then they won't franchise but they'll go out and start teaching what you've taught them how do you deal with things like that good question i'm fortunate that i i you know and i can say this most people won't believe it but that i literally have no direct competition when i mean direct there is no xci guy teaching spy secrets that can save your life you know i've taken this to the masses i'm the only one doing it now as far as indirect competition my competition is the Navy SEALs who are teaching the shooting classes or the Navy SEAL stuff. And then my other competition is the survival guys who are teaching, you know, here's how to make a fire 10 different ways in the outdoors. Here's how to make your off the grid home and cook a rabbit. So those guys are my competition. But again, they're not direct because I'm teaching the spy secrets and nobody else is. I'm surprised that other CAA guys who've retired don't do the same thing, who have the, the entrepreneurial spirit. So I get guys, I'm fortunate that, you know, a ton of guys who are XCIA work for me and work with me and they leave the agency and they don't have the entrepreneurial uh, ambitions. They just want to come and teach the courses. So I'm able to have this constant stream of very skilled people who I can, who can help me do, uh, help me do things with my company. So you're working for the CIA, you get married. What are you allowed to tell your wife or not tell her? Or is there a cover story that you have to go with and just totally ignore it altogether? Sure. So I I was actually lucky. I didn't get married to my wife until after I left the agency. I was single. And as anybody will tell you, it is a single man's game. Uh, You know, probably 80% of the guys I knew were divorced who were doing the super cool stuff. So it is a tough life if you want to raise, you know, have a family and raise kids. Uh, So when I left the agency and met my wife, you know, I was able to tell her, hey, I'm ex-CIA. But yes, there are things that I still can't tell her. And it's funny. Some, a, a group of people were asking me the other day, like, listen, if your wife was on her deathbed, 
and she asked you some questions, would you tell her? And I said, you know, of course not. It, you know, it's confidential information. I signed a secrecy agreement. You know, nothing's going to change that. And what if she, you know, some miracle she wakes up, then I have to live with that for the rest of my life. So there's some stuff she'll never know. So if she's on her deathbed, is she really going to want to ask you questions about the CIA anyways, or is there more important things? Probably not. So you've made some changes to your website and some improvements to try and drive business and stuff like that, especially at the bequest of your partner from the show. What kind of things did you do? Sure. So I am no internet marketing expert by far, but luckily I've been surrounded by the ones who are the best in the business. So basically is I'm fortunate that I have a bunch of different products. So we have physical products, we have a spy store, we have our live training classes, and we have online video courses. So probably the most important thing we did is we had a very good squeeze page, one Shark Tank Air that captured their email addresses. And then we had an immediate offer where they could get an online video of the online spy escape innovation training. And it kind of takes you through the funnel that you have to have where, you know, you have a $27 product, you have a $97 product, you have a $297 product, then you can sell the $997 product. But you've got to have that funnel of many different products because if you only have one product, you don't have a business. And I remember one of my mentors telling me that. So we were able to capture, you know, thousands of email addresses, send them down this funnel, which is why I'm fortunate that we're making so much money and doing so well today. What kind of new marketing ideas did you have to learn from him that you didn't already know? Or basically what kind of things did he contribute, especially like digital marketing and web pages and stuff like that, that maybe you did know already or you didn't know and he explained it to you? I was, I was familiar with this. I knew how it worked, but I didn't know how, how to implement it and all the little tweaks. So I knew the stuff, as I just mentioned, listen, you got to start with a 27, then go nine. You know, I knew all that, but... I didn't know, as you said, the, the little tweaks about tripwires and the you know, video sales letters and all that stuff, which makes it so critical. So, that, yeah, that's kind of where I, where I learned all of it. So if people want to get on your email list and get started with any of this, where would you direct them? Do you have a sign-up email or a website address that they go to to get started? If they just go to spyescape.com, they will learn a ton about internet marketing because you'll see my pop-up, you'll see my banner ads on the right, you'll see my sales copy. Uh, which is among the best in the business. So just go to that website and it'll teach him a ton. So if you're interested in learning about marketing, go to his site and see how he does things and, and learn the techniques and of what you see there. And you might as well buy his book while he's there. If you don't buy it there, then you can buy it probably in our store too. We'll add it before this, this airs so you can buy it here too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny you just mentioned that because I'm probably on a dozen plus email lists doing the exact same thing. So, you know, what are the offers he's sending out? Hey, did he just give a great headline or a great email? So, yeah, if, if anybody's uh, an entrepreneur, they should be on dozens of email lists following what the bright people are doing. Just like any business, you get haters. And I've seen how, on occasion, you've dealt with some of those haters publicly, which uh, sometimes can be funny. Um, especially in martial arts, I've noticed that uh, we certainly get our fair share of haters, especially people who claim to be the bomb and they've never even gone to train with the masters uh, there's all kinds of reasons jealousy is a big one especially in our culture how do you deal with that yourself i mean we've seen already that you've publicly shamed someone before which was funny but um you must have a pretty thick skin or you probably have to i suppose if you're in the cia well i think a critical thing that i, lo I luckily learned early on is you've got to have a thick skin and you cannot care what other people think as long as you're doing the right thing so I know I am teaching information which has saved people's lives, and it's literally saved people's lives on more than one occasion, and will continue to. So if some knucklehead on the internet sends me something negative, I could care less. So I get, you know, the more successful you become, the more haters you become. I mean, look at Donald Trump and anybody who's famous and all the backlash they get. But that is one of the reasons or one of the, you know, fortunate things about becoming uh, well-known in your industry and me and my own little niche so yeah, I could care less about all the haters because I know I'm doing the right stuff. What kind of mistakes have you been making or have made in the past? Are you perfect or are you just like everybody else and you've made mistakes? Maybe if there's someone listening, you can enlighten us all, myself included, as to what kind of mistakes you've made and what you would do differently, what you would avoid, what you well, what we should avoid, things like that. You know, oh, there's. I mean, we fail so much as entrepreneurs. We're failing all the time. Uh, but, you know, I just plow through them and learn from them. I'd say one is organization. All entrepreneurs are terribly organized. I still am today. 
but just forcing yourself to get more systems and processes in the business early on and not waiting until that dike is about to explode, um, which is what I did so many times. And then you're scrambling like a madman, madman trying to put in those systems and processes. And then the other thing is you've got to find business people who are smarter than you. So I was fortunate even before Damon to have many mentors who were already multimillionaires, did great stuff. So find those people to look over your contracts. You know, you need lawyers for that, but lawyers are still only lawyers. You need business people who know how to negotiate well and do that stuff. So probably my, my number one advice is still you got to belong to masterminds. You got to find people who are smarter than you. And that's been one of the key things in growing my business. What are you using to help yourself out? Do you have a new app that we don't know about or an organizational skill, a book of some kind? What what little secret do you have that is essential for you and your daily business life? I am probably one of the few guys on the planet who runs a seven-figure business with a flip phone. I don't own a cell phone. I don't have any magic stuff. Basically, I have Infusionsoft. I don't know how to use it. So when I say find people smarter to hand that stuff to is I find all these technologies that do well and then I hand them off to other people because I don't want to waste my time on them because the, my highest value is creating the next ideas, finding out what people want, which will keep them safer. So I'm a product and idea, man. And that's the only thing I should be doing. That's hilarious that an XCIA officer is using a, a, a flip phone instead of the newest and greatest phones that are on the market. That's great. I would say if you knew how many identities were stolen and how many apps were actually malware, you would not carry around a, uh, a smartphone. I guarantee it. As we all know, common cell phones these days are very addicting. So that's hard. It's a hard thing to give up. But it is so easy to extract your information and steal your identity. But again, I know nobody's going to listen to me on that one. When you went on television, was there anything that surprised you that cut you off guard when you first got there? Or do you have any insider information? I don't. And the only reason I, I don't is because I, I really did more research. So I read every single book the sharks that have ever written. I watched every single Shark Tank episode. I wrote notes of every question every shark liked to ask. So I knew what they were likely to ask me. And then I practiced my pitch over a thousand times. So there, were, uh, there was a lot of lead up. You know, I had 30, 60 days, whatever the real time frame was till I knew I was pitching. So at least 25 times a day, I was doing my pitch in front of the mirror, walking around the house. My wife used to laugh at me because I'd walk through the house doing the pitch and she'd chime in because she had it memorized. So just do research like nobody's business and you'll come off. You, you shouldn't have a problem. Okay. So if any of you are interested in getting involved with spy techniques and spy training, You'll want to check out his books. We have them available in our store and his products and his courses that he offers as well. What website should they go to check all that stuff out, Jason? So spysafety.com is our spy course. But if they go to spyescape.com, that's our main web page where they can see all the products we offer. They can see the book and they can also learn on the marketing, uh, the type of marketing we're doing. Thank you, Jason. That was Jason Hansen joining us, ex-CIA officer who specializes in safety and escape and evasion type training. For a Where Are They Now segment, I was going to do one on Duran Navan of Israel because we haven't heard from him in a little while. So I thought I would look into it, and it was very hard to find some information on this man. He just disappeared as if he were a ninja or something. But I did find a little bit of something, so I thought I would pass along what I found. So, Doran Navan essentially was the first foreign Bujanka Jihan, and the first Gajin who passed the Gudan test under Masaki Hatsumi. Doran Navan of Israel started training in Judo under Gadi Skornik in Israel and was later promoted to the Olympic team. Fortunately, he missed the Munich Olympic Games because of a serious tournament injury. Doran was one of the first Israeli professionals who studied Krav Maga, with Imi Lichtenfeld and later with Elie Abikazar, the father of Krav Maga in the United States. Doran traveled to Japan, studied Judo in the Kodokan, and years later passed his fourth degree Judo black belt under his Kodokan teacher. While living in Japan, Doran started learning Ninjutsu under Masaki Hatsumi Sensei, the headmaster of Bujinkan School. After many years of living and learning, he was awarded the Shihan grade and a certificate to be a dojo cho to Israel. The first foreign Nijitsu dojo outside Japan was opened by Duran Navan in 1976 in a rural area near Tel Aviv. Apart from intense meditation and martial arts training with Duran, was the first martial arts teacher who passed the Feldenkrais instructor's course while incorporating 
invaluable insights from yoga, judo, and a few other places. Duran was a personal friend of Moshi Feldenkrais. Duran has now retired from martial arts instruction and is continuing his meditational and movement practices and research in Japan. He does have a Facebook page, but after careful investigation, I found a small line of print on that page that said it was a tribute page. So even though you can like and follow, it is probably not his personal page. Other than this information, uh, he has basically disappeared. So that's where we are with him today. And this week in the Bujinkan, some of this is slightly old news, some of it is new news. But basically what we have come to know as the yellow Honbu membership cards in Japan have been discontinued. A lot of you may know that already because that's somewhat old news. The Shidoshi Kai, as you've known it, has been discontinued in a way. It has been altered. It does not exist as the Shidoshi Kai anymore. The Shidoshi Kai membership cards do not exist anymore. And the Honbu membership cards do not exist anymore. But basically, what has... Let's start with the name. So, it's now called Buyukai or Buyukai. Buyukai. There's a difference, and they're, they are the same at the same time. We'll get to that. And um, basically, the, the, uh, the minute details of that is that each Daishihan is able to, if they so choose, have their own membership cards and their own membership fees for anyone who falls under their line. Hatsumi Sensei, as a, or the Bujinkan as a head, will no longer do that. As this is kind of old news, the name and the organization itself is somewhat new. This is this is the current information you're getting. So, basically, the new name stems from two words. Buyu is the qualitative word for bravery. Yujo means friendship. And Hatsumi Sensei has combined the two to create Buyu Kai which means martial friends. The Buyu Kai, as martial friends, is what's replacing the Shiroshi Kai. When you say this without the double U, so like Buyu Kai, but now we have Buyu Kai also, which means a club for happiness. So we have a combination, the Buyu Kai, the Buyu Kai, and the Buyu Kai. Slight difference. Sometimes, and I'm sure many people will not say it properly, that's okay, because they both really go together. And he said that his, the prime mandate of this new Buyukai was to promote friendship, love, peace, and justice among the Bujinkan brothers, as we know, especially online, especially doubly so on Facebook, people bicker and fight. And it seems like within martial arts, it's the worst, which doesn't make any sense to me. You're truly not a martial artist if you don't have a spirit of peace and happiness and love and joy and compassion. So, I think this is wonderful. We are now tackling a more family-oriented version of this. And, not sure if it's relevant or not, but at the first official Buyukai membership, uh, um, not membership, but uh, meeting, Hatsumi Sensei gave to Dai Shihan Phil Lagar something that he called Buyusho, which is a certificate. And it is to honor his commitment and friendship to the Bujinkan for as many years as he has been. He's the only one to have received this. Whatever that actually means, I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll find out in the near future. You have to let it all go, Neo. Fear, doubt, and disbelief. Free your mind. I just want to make an impact, a positive impact, on as many people as possible. You gotta wanna succeed as bad as you wanna breathe. When you're down, you might feel like you wanna give up. Don't stop. Keep moving. Keep breathing. There's a war on consciousness in our society. There is an awakeness, an awareness that sees it all. And it's in you too. It's in all of us. Now.
We have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Create culture. Create culture. He is legend. He is going where no one has gone before. For centuries, they lived in peace. Never assume they are better than ever. They are coming. They will come. They will find you. Now he is on his own. The nation is under siege. They can attack him. They can judge him. All he wanted was to be loved, was to belong, was to fight. Their adventure will rock the silver screen. The Cold Moon, Wisdom from the Ninja Village. Heritage of the Ninja. Like the fathers of your grandfathers, it was your destiny to become a ninja. From teachers in far-off lands, your ancestors discovered the secrets of the universe and the means to complete joy in existence. For this, they were hunted down in their mountain homes by those who feared the potential of enlightened common men. Thus was born the legend of the invisible warriors, mountain mystics who guided their powers into ways of protecting the innocents that they loved and the truths they sheltered. Yours is a legacy of service to those in need, protection to those in distress, and strength to those who are overpowered. Your martial art is the way of stealth, silent means of working your will without actions. Your reward is spiritual growth and the opportunity to be a conscious part of the scheme of totality. You will be misunderstood for utilizing violence to create authentic peace. You will be condemned for using deceit as a demonstration of your bravery. You will be despised for employing trickery to allow others to see reality. You will be seen as an executioner, though you are a priest. Men will call you coward, though you battle the dragons of fear and ignorance. Welcome to the family. My desire to speak faith into the lives of others, encouraging them when they are discouraged, calling forth the seeds of greatness God planted within them, assuring them that their best days are ahead. My prayer is to inspire you and to expand your vision so you might find the courage to overcome any obstacles and accomplish your dreams. God has great things in store for you. A new season is coming. I hope my words ignite your faith and increase God's favor in your life. Psalm 84.11 says, No good thing will God withhold to those who walk uprightly. When you have a heart to please God and when you live a life of excellence and integrity, being your best each day, living with purpose and passion and a desire to help others, God's promise is that He will not withhold what you need to become you or what He has created you to be. God will not withhold wisdom, creativity, good breaks, the right connections, strength, joy, or victory. You may have been through challenging times. The economic downturn has affected people of all ages and incomes. Millions have lost their jobs. Millions more have seen their savings depleted. Many have lost their homes. Relationships have been strained. We've all been tested. History has shown that economic depressions and recessions surely do cause suffering, but they also serve as a catalyst for inspiration, creativity, and new levels of achievement that ultimately make for better lives and a better world. Many of the world's strongest corporations and family businesses were forged in times such as these. Some doors have closed, 
but others will open. So, every month, with my students at least, we make some changes and we rotate them on a monthly basis to vary our training and we go through a list so it's organized. And one of the things we did recently was studying the sounds and the pictures of firearms and identifying them quickly. Especially the sounds. And why this might benefit us is because if you are in public and you hear an active shooter scenario beginning, you can identify the sound of the weapon, thus knowing what type of weapon that is being used, how many rounds are in the magazine, how fast it fires, what size of caliber, therefore knowing what type of protection you may need, um, details of how to approach or escape, protecting your family, there's a lot that can be determined from the sound if you know what type of rifle it is and you understand, or, or firearm in general. So, I looked up the top 20 most common firearms sold in the United States. And then I put together with a program called Anki, A-N-K-I, which I'll probably offer in the store, our store, so you can download it. And the decks, there's decks to go with it, because basically what it is, it's a program that creates flashcards digitally and determines the best timings and frequency to show them to you so that you best memorize them. And it does all that behind the scenes. It's really good. I use it for a lot of other things, too. But anyway, the point is that um, I thought maybe I could share some of that with you right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the sound of a firearm and give you a chance to see if you can identify what type of firearm it is. And I will tell you in if, after a few seconds. So here comes your first one. See if you can determine what type of weapon this is. So what was that? Can you tell? Can you guess? Going once, going twice, gone. That was the AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. Here's another one. Any guesses on that one? Going once. Going twice. That was the Colt LE6920 semi-auto. And before you ask, yes, some of these are very, very similar. I mean, some might argue it's the exact same gun. But when I looked up the 20 most sold weapons, the most sold firearms, these were the exact configurations, exactly as is that were sold, and they were on a list of 20. So, if it's good enough for the list, it's good enough for me. Next one. That was the DPMS Oracle. The next one. That was the Glock G19, 9mm. Next. That was the Heritage Arms Rough Rider. The next one.
That was the Caltech KSG shotgun. Next one. That was the Caltech Sub 2000 assault rifle, which I like because it folds in half and you can put it in your backpack when you're hiking into the mountains to protect yourself from wild animals and the like. So it's a good, it's a good one that's often cho chosen by preppers or outdoorsmen, think that kind of things. It's it's compact because of the folding, which is neat. Anyway, next one. That one was the Mossberg 500 Tactical. And then the next one. That is the Mossberg 590A1 shotgun. Next. Any guesses on that one? That was the Remington 870 police shotgun. What is that one? Any guesses? That is the Ruger AR-556. Short and sweet on that one. What was it? What was it? It was the Ruger Blackhawk. Next! What's that one? That is the Ruger LCR, which stands for Light Compact Revolver. And the next one. What's that one? That is the Ruger Lightweight Compact Pistol, Semi-Auto. And another one. What was that one? That was the 6-Hour P938. One more. That was the... Smith and Wesson 629. And another one. How about that one? Any guesses on that? That is the Smith and Wesson MP Shield. 9mm semi auto. And MP stands for military and police. Here comes another one. That was the Smith & Wesson m and 15. And we have two more. Here comes the next one. That was the Springfield XDS 9mm. And the very last one. Here we go. Any guesses on that one, our final one? That is the Taurus 85. 
Revolver. And since podcasts are largely audio and not much of else, I thought that I could also introduce you to some of the other projects I'm working on. So we would start with, I've been doing a video on the Tenshi Jin Ryaku no Maki. And while I can't show video, there's a few audio clips I can take from that. And I thought I would start with one of the main songs or music that is introduced on the videos to f for filler kind of thing. And some of you may recognize it, but I doubt it. Nonetheless, here it is.
we've also got about five minutes left in the podcast or so, and I thought that I'm also working on a project of audiobooks. And I've been taking things like Hatsumi Sensei's books, ones that are not technical and are more informative, because describing technical things is not productive, really. So, so um, I thought I'd at least finish off the podcast, maybe with five minutes worth of or so of one of the ones that I finished already. And you may recognize this one as Ninjutsu History and Tradition. And I made it a podcast version because some people don't like to, to read, which is um, terrible in and, in and of itself. But uh, for those who don't want to read or maybe want to read Hasumi's books while on their commute, you can buy these books on our store, the audiobook versions as well, by the way. And here is the first five minutes of that book, and we'll sign off with that. Thank you very much. If you want to get in contact with our podcast, you can uh, visit our website at DivineWarriorNijutsu.com, or you can email me at DivineWarriorNijutsu at gmail.com as well. Again, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Ninjutsu History and Tradition, Dr. Masaki Hatsumi, 34th Grand Master of the Togokure Ryu. Dedication I have had in this lifetime the rare fortune to have encountered a divinely inspired warrior sage. This book then is dedicated to the master teacher, Toshitsugu Takamatsu, as an expression of my gratitude for all that he gave me. Acknowledgement this book would not have been possible without the cooperation and encouragement of my student, Shidoshi Stephen K. Hayes, and blooming in the shadows, the Kunoichi Rumiko. May happiness last forever for them, and may their family continue to grow and expand in health, prosperity, and understanding. It is my prayer that this book of ours will make even a small contribution towards deepening the friendship between the nations and people of Japan and the United States. About the Author Dr. Masaki Hatsumi was born in Noda City, Chiba Prefecture, on December 2, 1931. He graduated from Meiji University in Tokyo with a major in theater studies, and now is the director of his own chiropractic clinic in Noda City. In the 1950s and 1960s, Dr. Hatsumi continuously traveled across Japan to study with Toshitsugu Takamatsu, Akashiwara City, Nara Prefecture, from whom he received his initiation into the life ways of the ninja. The author later inherited from his teacher the authority and position of headmaster in the following Japanese martial traditions. 34th Soke of Tokokure Ryu Ninjutsu, originally founded by Daisuke Tokokure. 28th Soke of Gyokoryu Koshijutsu, originally founded by Hakun Sai Tozawa. 28th Soke of Kukushinryu Hapo Hikenjutsu, originally founded by Izumo Kanja Yoshiteru. 26th Soke of Shinden Futoryu Dakentaijutsu, originally founded by Izumo Kanja Yoshiteru. 18th Soke of Kotoryu Kopojutsu, originally founded by Sandayu Momochi. 18th Soke of Gikanryu Kopojutsu, originally founded by Sonyu Hangan Gikanbo, Lord of Kawachi. 17th Soke of Takagi Yoshinryu Jutaijutsu, originally founded by Oryoemon Shiganobu Takagi, 14th Soke of Kumugakureryu Ninpo, originally founded by Henai Zaemon Iyanaga Iga, who adopted the name Kumugakure Hoshi. 21st Soke of Gyokushinryu Ninpo Hapo Hiken. Now retired from active teaching, Dr. Masaki Hatsumi no longer accepts new personal students. He supervises the Bushinkan, Warrior God Training Hall, organization, made up of his students who now carry Shihan and Chidoshi instructor titles and carry out the teaching work on a worldwide basis. Authorist Preface I believe that Ninpo, the higher order of Ninjutsu, should be offered to the world as a guiding influence for all martial artists. The physical and spiritual survival methods eventually immortalized by Japan's ninja were in fact one of the sources of Japanese martial arts. Without complete and total training in all aspects of the combative arts, today's martial artists cannot hope to progress any further than mere proficiency in a limited set of muscular skills that make up his or her training system. Personal enlightenment can only come about through total immersion in the martial tradition as a way of living. By experiencing the confrontation of danger, the transcendence of fear or injury or death, and a working knowledge of individual personal powers and limitations, the practitioner of Nijutsu can gain the strength and invincibility that permit enjoyment of the flowers, moving in the wind, 
appreciation of the love of others, and contentment with the presence of peace in society. The attainment of this enlightenment is characterized by the development of the jihi no kokoro, or benevolent heart. Stronger than love itself, the benevolent heart is capable of encompassing all that constitutes universal justice, and all that finds expression in the unfolding of the universal scheme. Born of the insight attained from a repeated exposure to the very brink between life and death, Ninpo's benevolent heart is the key to finding harmony and understanding in the realms of the spiritual and natural material worlds. After so many generations of obscurity in the shadowy recesses of history, the life philosophy of the ninja is now once again emerging, because once again, it is the time in human destiny in which Ninpo is needed. May peace prevail so that mankind may continue to grow and evolve into the next great plateau. Dr. Masaki Hatsumi, 34th Grand Master of Togokure Ryu. The Essence of Ninjutsu A ninja popularity boom has been developing in Japan over the past decades, and the public has been flooded with movie, TV, and paperback novel ninja characters. 